I'm Dan Lax from Chemical Engineering, and um, talk about some programs that we've had uh, now, now in three places. Um, in Niger, which is uh, the, the one in the up here. I won't talk mu much about that. That was a research project. Um, Senegal over here and, and Botswana. And these are in collaboration with uh, Mohan Sankaran, another professor in the department, and Mamadou Sow, who's here. He's a postdoc and now also a, uh, an adjunct uh, uh, assistant professor in our department. Um, so just uh, to introduce you to collaborators, that's uh, Mohan there. This is um, a former grad student uh, of, of who worked with me and Mohan, uh, Keith Forward. And um, Mamadou's here, so I didn't need to introduce him, but uh, this was us in uh, Niger. The other picture was in Botswana. So anyway, what's that? Those white giraffes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was a lot of fun. Um, the work we did in Niger was um, research on uh, dust storms. It's hard to see, but there's a big dust storm coming. Uh, we should have taken the picture when it got a little closer. But um, it, <laughs> it was, uh, it, we, we were in a car, uh, uh, so, so it, it came through and engulfed the car. Um, and uh, this, uh, we, we did research on the electrostatic charging of particles when they rub each against each other. We worked with uh, undergraduates from the university there. Um, I won't go much into detail other than say that actually Paul and I have two collaborations. Uh, the one you mentioned, and another one is related to uh, electrostatic charging and um, going back to see who really started working on it. <laughs> it's always attributed to this uh, one particular Greek person. So anyway, there's a couple courses that um, uh, I've been uh, uh, working with, with these Africa things. One is the uh, Senior Design Project course that I teach. Um, all, all seniors in chemical engineering have to take this course, and they work in, in groups of about three to five. And um, in the past couple of years, we took them uh, to, to villages in Africa um, with, the, with the goal of finding, uh, designing processes to develop electricity for, for the villages. So uh, the, both these villages here, uh, there, there's no electricity. Botswana is a wealthier country, and they already have a program to um, provide solar power. So uh, yeah, you know, here solar power is kind of seen as kind of a trendy, expensive thing for, for people to do because they're green. But um, if, you're, if you're far away from other things, it's very expensive to run electrical wires. And for a small village uh, that's kind of far away from things, it's much more expensive to run electrical wires to it than, say, to use uh, solar power or other methods. And um, yeah, this village in, in uh, Senegal then, um, they, uh, they don't even have any, any solar power. But as, as uh, when we went there, we learned that they all have cell phones. <laughs> uh, but there's nowhere to charge a cell phone, so they have to go to the nearest city, which is 20 kilometers away, it, by donkey cart. There's no cars there either. Um, and as I'll show you, there's no water even, not even not running water, there's just no water. They have to bring their water in. Um, and anyway, so, so the project is to, to provide ways here uh, in this year's project to at least uh, power cell phones so that you don't have to spend all day going to get your cell phone charged. Uh, here's a, a little movie just to show how far off the beaten path uh, the village in Senegal is. So it was about um, maybe uh, five miles off the road like this, and then you know once you even get to the main road, it's still uh, uh, five miles or so to the city. Uh, here are some pictures of the village just to kind of see what it's like. Um, the people there are very friendly. This was all th this and the Niger were, was all set up by uh, Mamadou. Okay, uh, Mamadou is originally from Senegal, and his cousin is a teacher in this village. And that's how he did it. And the Niger, he also set up. And that's because he, he previously, during his PhD, did research in Niger on dust storms. Um, so anyway, it was, uh, yeah, you know, everyone was very welcoming and friendly. Um, and uh, this was a meeting with the village chief here, this guy here, about what engineering issues they, they faced. So when we went there, we didn't know that the electricity and the cell phone thing would be the project. We were actually thinking more uh, water purification. Um, but uh, so, so we talked to him about different uh, issues um, that the village faces, and, and we decided that the electricity for cell phones would be something that we could really do, um, the students could do within a uh, semester. And they're working on prototypes now uh, where you convert mechanical energy to electrical, kind of, so kind of like stationary bikes, because you don't really need a lot of electricity to do this. Um, but it's a lot easier than um, 
than uh, you know this all-day trek to the uh, to the city. And uh, so uh, you know he he only speaks Wolof, so uh, Mamadou translated. Uh, me and the students don't speak Wolof. Uh, this is the uh, the teacher Mamadou's cousin. Uh, this is, like I say, they don't even have a well in the village. Um, they have to get water from uh, a well that's, uh, the nearest one is about a kilometer, but that's not always working. And if that's not working, they have to go, I think, about seven kilometers. And so they have to bring them here and they put them in the water into uh, cisterns. Um, so uh, the, the students uh, had a good time interacting with the students at, uh, in the village there. They played uh, some soccer. Um, and uh, we also, uh, Mamadou had the idea to bring uh, a bunch of uh, school supplies, because uh, it's a very poor village. Um, and so th there's a bunch here. We also brought calculators with a Case Western logo and, and gave them out. And uh, so you could see the uh, calculator lesson here. This is just a few seconds. <laughs> so, um, so after the village, uh, we went to a couple other places in Senegal, um, uh, a, a city called Moor, which is right on the, uh, the ocean. And then um, we went to the university, the main university in Dakar, and met with faculty there also to, to discuss things. So that's um, one thing, the, uh, the, uh, the design course. And the, uh, the other project I have with Paul with the, um, the Greek anti-Kythera mechanism uh, is involved in that uh, design course, I said. So you know, one group went on to uh, Senegal. Most of the groups work with local chemical companies. Uh, one group went to Senegal. Another group is working with Paul on designing a prototype that hopefully he could talk about a little later. So the other class that I, uh, the uh, other thing that we've done in Botswana uh, is, is um, engineering uh, 225, which is a required course for all engineering uh, majors. So there's about 350, 400, 450, whatever, engineers a year. And everyone has to take it. They don't always take it in their first or second year. It depends on their major. But they all have to take it some sometime. And so what we did was we decided to teach a version, a three-week version in Botswana. Um, and it's the same exact curriculum as a course here. It's a four-credit uh, course uh, taught in you know, Strosacker or something, a big lecture hall. And so we do it in, uh, in Botswana. We want to do it with a, uh, a big course so that we get a lot of people who, who'd be interested. So last year was the first time we had 21 students. Uh, this year we have uh, 22. Um, there's the University of Botswana where we, uh, we teach a course. And um, so we teach it, it's a three-week course. It usually, again, it's a regular semester-long course. Uh, but we teach it as a three-week course, which at first people kind of question, you know, how can you teach a whole semester in three weeks? Well, the thing is, um, usually you have um, five courses over 15 weeks in a semester. So three weeks per one course is exactly the same. And um, it actually has a lot of advantages doing it um, one course at a time, because we meet for about four hours a day, maybe three and a half hours a day, every day. And it's really perfect for experiential learning, where what you do is, uh, you know, it's not four hours of lecture, but it might be a half hour of lecture, then maybe a half hour of problem solving. Um, the students get to do their homework. Uh, right then on the pro what they just learned about. So here's an example. Uh, there's the uh, Professor Mohan uh, Sankaran, um, you know, interacting with students as they do their homework. Some work in groups. Uh, you know, some work, like to work by themselves. You could uh, see if you're doing things right, get help when you need. And so we kind of cycle through the um, a little bit of lecture, a little bit of problem solving, and you know, some breaks in there. So it actually works out, I think, very well. It's something we didn't really mean to do, but but when we um, when we found out about it, it actually uh, works well. 
Um, so here's an example, then we also relate the course content um, to this whole learning cycle idea. So one thing that I'll talk briefly about is the, um, these African mud huts um, that I guess they also have in, uh, in Turkey, the mud huts. Uh, they seem very primitive, but there's actually something very, very clever about them, is that they act as passive air conditioners that keep you cool during the day when it's hot out, and they act as uh, passive heaters that keep you warm at night. Okay, and so it's really a clever thing, and so we address this. So we, we went around the Kolb learning cycle. So first the students do um, reflective observation, and then I couldn't get a good picture for that. We, um, we derive the relative heat transfer equations, um, and then we, uh, we solve them. And here's the solution, so it's actually solved uh, numerically. So this is the outside temperature. So this method works in, kind of in these dry environments where it gets very hot during the day but very cold, at, kind of cold at night. And we found that there, in the day, students are wearing shorts and if you do any hiking or walking, you're kind of sweaty. At night, you need a sweatshirt. Okay, and so that's actually a good thing in terms of this design that you see this is the temperature inside the house and it's exactly at a phase. So when it's hot outside, it's coolest in the house. When it's cool outside, it's hottest in the house. And it's kind of a thermal inertia for the wall that the wall, it's not acting as insulation but kind of as a heat sink. That during the day, it's soaking up the heat um, and preventing it from going inside, not by blocking it, by, but by absorbing the heat. And then at night, it's releasing the heat, and so it releases it both inside and outside. So it, um, it heats up the, the hut at night, and during the day, it prevents the, uh, the heat from coming in. And it's, it's exactly, uh, depending on the thickness of the wall, you can make it exactly out of phase. And, and, and so it's really a clever thing. Some other examples of how we related the course content to, um, to uh, related the technical material to Africa. Um, when talking about uh, fluid mechanics, uh, we went to visit a well in a village and we got the specifications for the well, how deep it is, how much water is pumped, how wide the pipes, and then um, did calculations on this exact well to see how much it, energy it takes to pump the water and how it fits into the village budget. Uh, in regard to phase transitions, um, uh, we uh, looked at the transition between car, um, graphite and diamond, and then related that to uh, the diamond industry, which um, Botswana is actually a wealthy country in Africa. It's uh, the world's biggest producer of diamonds. And so we went on a field trip to the, the world's biggest diamond mine. Um, and also looking at energy uh, of, of flowing fluids, um, we went, took a trip to Victoria Falls in, in Zimbabwe, and in the class we also calculated how much energy is liberated by the water flowing over the falls, and, and we calculated it's enough to power 10 million light bulbs. And then another thing, uh, there's more cows than people in Botswana, and a source of energy is cow dung. And so uh, using some lab uh, experiments in, in another program that I'll talk about in a minute, uh, you could see that one kilogram, uh, the students did a calculation, that one kilogram of cow dung could, um, could power 80 cell phone batteries, charge 80 cell phone batteries. So um, we also, I'll go through this kind of quickly, uh, took a kind of vacation in the middle of the course. We flew up to the northern part of Botswana, and that's when we went to uh, Zimbabwe, to uh, Victoria Falls, and um, also went on safari. This was back in Botswana. I'll just show a little bit of the uh, safari. So we did a couple uh, things in the safari, one uh, a boat trip, and then also a, uh, a land-based one. So one of the things I'll say is that this costs exactly the same as taking the course on campus during the summer. 
there's no extra charge. You know, they had to pay for room and board and, and travel, but the tuition's exactly the same. Just some other things we saw on the safari. This was a, uh, a leopard, some of the students saw. Um, we also did some cultural things, like this is a traditional uh, sport where um, it's to, to practice hunting rabbits, where one, one person throws a, uh, a wheel and the other person has to try to hit it with a, uh, a club. Uh, did some hiking, traditional uh, music and dancing. Uh, these were some uh, ancient rock paintings uh, there. Uh, so that's a course. So now we have another program that's really totally separate, but run at the same time. I'll just do this very quickly. Um, it's a, a research program there on um, sustainable energy for sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we have an NSF grant for that. It's a three-year grant uh, uh, for 150000 And it funds um, each year uh, five US and five Botswana students to do research in, in laboratories at the University of Botswana on sustainable energy. And this is not just a case program. It's open to other universities also, so we advertise uh, nationally. And uh, we run this at the same time of the course, so we, we do them uh, kind of uh, together, so we're there for both, but they're, they're separate programs. Um, uh, quickly, uh, had a we had a sabbatical visitor, uh, Rufus Akande from the University of Botswana, and he and I taught a uh, SAGES seminar on uh, education in sub-Saharan Africa, the first time I ever did a, a SAGES class. And um, we also had a uh, alumni dinner in uh, Botswana. So it turns out that there's um, maybe about 20 uh, case alumni in Botswana, including the head of the nursing school. Okay, they're mainly, I think, uh, nursing and MSAS uh, students, uh, uh, alums there. So anyway, that's... Um, Did you I, have MSAS alumni there also? Um, I wasn't here for this, because I split the course with um, Mohan Sankaran here. So I did the first half, he did the second. So he was at the... Uh, Alumni dinner. Yeah. I yeah. Have a, I have a question about the um, courses that you do, particularly with that Kolb cycle. Yeah. And uh, I admit, I know that the students here on campus are not getting the same kind of experience. So then these students come back to campus again. <laughs> Do you see any difference in the way that they choose to study, learn, you know, that quality? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I don't know. We've just done this one, one year so far. We, we did it last year, and we're doing it again second time this year. But I was really, I, I really like the, I, this one course at a time thing. Um, some colleges do this, like I know um, Colorado, College. Colorado College, I think uh, Cornell College in Iowa, and the, there's, a, I think, a couple others, um, where you take one course for three weeks, and then after that, another course for three weeks, and so on. And it really, I think, ha has a lot of benefits. I, I thought the people, the students, were much more attentive in lectures. And um, uh, yeah, you know, we had the class. Uh, we, we told them you could get your homework done during the class time, or, or pretty much all of it. So the people really <laughs> worked pretty hard, you know, because it would be nice to get everything all done by 12:30 or so, and then. Yeah, you know, we had a lot of other activities and things. So, so I, I thought the people worked uh, worked very hard, and um, you know, because the the 50 minute class, you know, you kind of by the time you get started, and then yeah, you know, you do something, it's you know, time to end. You you certainly can't do both, um, you know, lecture, and then uh, you can maybe do one practice problem, but then you you know, you don't have time to help the students with with say homework or something. And so. you also relate it right into the field. Yeah, yeah. To me, I think that's that's a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. So I I think it went well. Yeah. I have a question just regarding the tuition cost. Um, yeah. It's a summer course because yeah. it's offered in May. So although the co cost of the course is the same, paying summer tuition is could be it's half price for summer tuition. It's half it's price. Half price. Most students yeah. don't take summer courses. So. It's, I mean, yeah. Oftentimes, a student wouldn't take this in the summer. They would take it during the school year. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it would cost more than taking it in the school year. Mm -hmm. But this course is also, the regular version is offered during the summer oh, it at is. Case. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's, uh, it's, like, like I say, all engineering students have to take it. You don't have to take it during the summer. Most people don't. Right. But you could take it during the summer. Okay. And it costs, the tuition's exactly the same. Right. Um, the room and board is more expensive here than in Botswana. Um, so you've got only uh, the flight to Botswana is the only thing that makes it more 
expensive. But, but actually, the room and board is so much cheaper for the three-week course in Botswana than it is here. It's an eight-week course. <laughs> So room and board for eight weeks is about the same as the flight to Botswana and room and board there. <laughs> so it's really about the same, same price. Yeah. This is hard to answer, I know, but what, do you have any feeling for the impact this had on the students, just the international experience? I, 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 think, I think it's been a great, it was really a, a good exp great experience for a lot. Um, I think just kind of the uh, independence of traveling somewhere on their own, because a lot of the people never even um, uh, you know, traveled uh, out of the US. Um, in fact, a funny thing, not the guy, a guy in, in the, the research program that I talked about, who's, he was an undergrad at Buffalo, it turns out he had never flown on a plane before in his life. <laughs> and the flight to, to get to Botswana is really, really long. It's, it's for longer than Australia, because yeah, you know, first, uh, the way he did it especially, you fly, you know, he flew Buffalo to New York, New York to London. <laughs> London to Johannesburg is a 12-hour flight. Then Johannesburg to uh, Haberone, Botswana, that's an hour, that's easy. But, um, yeah, you know, it's a really long, it's about 20,000 miles you get. <laughs> and um, so I think kind of just being able to do that, and he, he missed a, a leg on the way and he had to deal with all these things and got there late. So, so I think it was, um, yeah, you know, for him it was an especially uh, big travel experience, but just for everyone and, you know, kind of seeing a, a totally different kind of culture I think is good. Did you do anything in advance of these to help prepare the students for, for what they're, they're doing, or is it basically just do this and, and show up? We had a, um, a, like a one-hour session, uh, and that, that's, that's it. And otherwise, it was pretty much um, show up. We have for the UI, for the case students, for the research ones, yeah, you know, may, uh, we, we didn't even do that. Um, so maybe we'll want to do a little more, but it was pretty much just show up. Yeah. Have you considered adding an additional course so when they come back to the states, they can continue working on these problems? Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, um, well, the design project class, they, uh, yeah, I should have said that. Um, the, the Botswana one, uh, the course there was um, a three-week course. The design project one, where I took the student, we took the students to Senegal, and then the year before to Botswana, was only they only went for about um, five days. Uh, five days, four or five days there, and then about a week, including travel. And there, the goal is to come back and then work the rest of the semester on a project that they decided to work on. Do the students do their own flight arrangements? And yeah, yeah, yeah. We um, well, well, for the course they do, um, and. Uh, uh, I think that works out well so that you're not responsible for problems. And also, you don't book for someone and then they change your mind and say, oh, you know, it turns out I can't go and you're stuck with the ticket. So I think that worked well. For the NSF program, we booked for the students last year uh, and, you know, charges directly to the grant. And I think that was a mistake because the guy that had the problem and missed a leg, he then started calling us to you know, get in touch with the travel agent to rebook. And I think it would have been just easier if he booked himself and could deal with things himself. Um, so I think next year we're going to have the students book and then we pay them back. Plus in the summer they're home. So not everybody wants to take a group flight out of Cleveland. Some of yeah, yeah, they could fly from wherever they want. And it's actually uh, you know, a few hundred dollars cheaper to go out of New York than, right. than Cleveland. Well, you get a group rate for one of those university travel, you have to have, I think, at least 10 students. Oh, really? So we ended up having both years, the students just had to buy their own plane ticket, and we had given them this scholarship money to reimburse them. So they okay. their own ticket. Yeah, they actually got the scholarship money, some of them, before they bought the ticket, so. Yeah. You know, just to be a remaining call, and then the other project that you worked on, collaborate on the other one, mm -hmm. just to, to the group that might, that's interesting. Oh, classics and chemical engineering. Yeah, combined. that's interesting. Can you just yeah, I think that's cool. Well? Well, I have to say, Paul's really the expert on that. What I did is supply the uh, the manpower. <laughs> um, there's this ancient mechanical device called the Antikythera mechanism, and it was a device designed to compute various astronomical uh, calculations of uh, solar year, lunar solar year. Eclipses, eclipse prediction, this sort of thing. It dates to second or first century BC, and it was found in a boat wreck around 1900. And it's so fragile, it's made of bronze, that it 
hadn't been able to be studied fully until newer technologies became available. Um, if you want to know more about it, I'm actually giving a talk at 4.30 at Baker Nord on this very topic. Uh, uh, but uh, so these, there's two new techniques that were able to peer inside it that were non-invasive uh, or on the surface take photography of it. And I work on the inscriptions, and the inscriptions were never able to be read very well. But with these two new techniques, they could be. And uh, so I had a... Uh, I put in a NEH grant working with a astronomer and physicist in Thessaloniki where the data is of one of these new techniques. Uh, it's, uh, it's computed tomography scans and uh, they have to be reconstructed in a, there are 2D scans that get reconstructed into a 3D volume. Uh, so uh, I started working with him on it and because the people that have worked on this device, which is a thousand years earlier than any comparable device known to man, uh, kind, that uh, uh, they were all physicists and ancient historians. They weren't very good at ancient Greek. So I, I started reading the inscriptions on it, got very interested in it. Uh, it provides very useful information, historical information about a particular calendar uh, in the Greek world. Um, and then I suggested uh, to Dan that maybe some, he, he went to the talk, and the, uh, this guy from Thessaloniki came, gave a talk here at Case, and uh, I asked Dan if he had any students that might want to build a model of it, and he said, we'll try. So we're collaborating on that, he's providing the students uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the mechanical. Yeah, I think it worked out great because it's for this chemical engineering design course. And I didn't know this isn't really chemical engineering, you know, to build a model of this uh, device with the gears, you know, there's uh, about maybe 50 gears or so uh, involved. Um, and so, but I, it seemed like a cool thing, so I figured I'd, I'd tell the class about it, and if people choose it, they choose it. And so anyway, four students wanted to do it, and, uh, you know, they're, they're extremely excited. So. Yeah, you know, the project's ongoing now. I think it's really coming along great. And there's also now a student from mechanical engineering doing it. So there's five of them, and um, they, uh, they're, they're, they're really, really loving it. And so. How big is this? It's about the size this of big, the maybe? It's not that big. And the inscriptions are very, very fine on it. it uh, it's just an amazing device, and the, the care and in inscribing the documents and making the gears and everything is, is just amazing. It's just the most amazing device. <laughs> it really is. And how old again? It's uh, second or first century BC. The shipwreck is between 70 and 50 BC, probably closer to 65. And so it dates before that. It could be up to 100, 150 years earlier than the shipwreck. but but probably is within 50 years of the shipwreck, probably 150 to 100 BC is more likely. The inscriptions kind of tell you how to use it. There's an instruction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, on the, there's a front cover, and that explains the cycles of the planets. It describes them. Uh, you know, when you're viewing them in the sky, they look they're different than stars because they look like they're coming across and then they come to a stationary point and then they actually move backwards and then they start going forward again. And that they didn't know that they were planets as opposed to stars, but they knew they behaved differently. And they could see with their eye five of them uh, in antiquity. And uh, so the front of the device, the gears are meant to mimic the motions, the cyclic motions of the planets, and then also the sun and the moon. It, it, uh, this, this, the, the sun has an irregular pattern. All, it's not completely, pa uh, reg it has a regular irregular pattern. <laughs> and uh, so does the moon. Uh, so it also mimics those motions on the front of uh, the device. Uh, there's, uh, there's what's called a parapegma inscription on the front that tells you when you can expect certain constellations to rise and set. Then on the back, there's a calendar that is it's, it's a, what's called a lunar solar calendar. The ancients used lunar months, and, and, but 12 lunar months is about 11 days short of a solar year. So about every three years, you had to insert an extra lunar month to keep, your solar, to keep the, the months generally in line with the seasons. 
And uh, so that is called the metonic cycle. So the metonic cycle is 235 lunar months, and it has all the, month, the names of the months inscribed in the circle 235 times. Uh, and, and then it also has a, another dial below that that is an eclipse prediction dial. It's called the Saros cycle. And then within the metonic calendar, it has a games dial that lists all the major games, the Olympic games, the Isthmian games, the main games, Pythian games, and then two other more minor games that can tell you in what year to expect those games to take place. It's a very complex device. It also has a, probably a, calip a calipic dial that corrects the metonic calendar. Every 76 years, the metonic dial would get off. So it had a dial to correct that. Every and 76 years? Every 76 yeah, years, like a leap year, living. every 76 years. <laughs> they didn't live that long, did they? Well, the, they knew about it, though. So, yeah. I mean, it, they had to that be corrected. So if you were alive at that time, yeah. it had to be corrected. And then wow. there was also, for the Saros cycle, uh, it gets off by about eight hours every cycle of, of, of 18, of a little over 18 years, 223 lunar months. And so it corrected for that eight hour difference to keep the eclipses pretty much in line too. All in the size of shoes. It's all in the size of shoes. <laughs> so the students say they're gonna have the back face uh, that Paul was just talking about done by next week. Okay. Oh my well, gosh. They're also doing the inscriptions now and they're amazing. They, they're, they wanna, they have a laser cutter and they're using plastic rather than bronze because it's much cheaper. And uh, you know, they, they really want to know what the inscriptions say and where they are, and they're going to cut the inscription, use the laser cutter to cut the inscriptions. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much, Paul and Dan. Thank you.